So I can really say that all my investors have been catalyzed through, through Twitter interactions, which I think is pretty interesting. Um, that's cool. I mean, that's kind of been your story all along. And the same thing goes for the Wall Street Journal article. That, that, the, 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 it had its genesis in a, in a Reddit Ask Me Anything. Mm -hmm. So the, the author of that I, yeah, piece, those, yeah. yeah, so they were doing an, an AMA on rare diseases. So Amy Marcus, she's the Wall Street Journal reporter who wrote that article. And she and Chris Austin, who was from NCATS, the NIH Translational uh, Facility uh, Institute, they were just taking questions about rare diseases. So I, someone on Twitter actually said, hey, dude, you should check out this Ask Me Anything. They're talking about rare diseases. And I mm. thought, okay. I checked up, wrote a couple of questions, and then Amy Marcus followed up. I guess I piqued her interest, and then that, that's how the story formed. It's true. I mean, a lot of the ways that we uh, are operating, at, at least as, a, as our own lab, is taking some of those traditions. Like, for example, every Friday we have a happy hour or a TGIF. That was one of the best parts of graduate school that, that I remember because it was a place where, obviously, alcohol lubricates all interactions, but it's a place where you can kind of let your guard down, mingle, and kind of, you know, free associate in a nerdy way because you could talk about the science, but then you could also relate to people as people. Uh, so that's something we, from the, from the very first week I set the culture of the lab that, you know, that's one tradition from academia that I really, really like and so we're doing that. We also have a lab meeting and I don't know how other, you know, I'm sure every group, every startup has a, has a, has a meeting where they discuss things, but, you know, we, we have a, a, a a lab meeting that is modeled after every lab meeting that I've ever done, where you know some of them have been 90 minutes, where we are all going around talking about data, presenting data, and I'm sure other startups do this, but you know, t t most of my team is made up of academic castaways, so three of them are, are former postdocs, and I'm a former postdoc too, um, so all of us are very comfortable with you know with lab meeting and with this with with, with the kind of the rhythms of, of academic research. And I think, you know, if you were to kind of look at us and not know what we were doing, you might just say, let's look like any other academic lab. Is that too general for your investors? Um, no, it doesn't appear to be. Again, the, our strategic lead investor, Martin Schroeder. What was your pitch to him? Well, that's the thing. Because he's already in the orphan space and he yeah. has a clinical stage drug orphan drug company, yeah. the pitch was was actually just mostly talking about you know, which diseases we're going to look at and sort of higher level strategy. Didn't have to waste any time justifying orphan space, you know. Right. And, and so I, you have honed in on specific diseases. Oh, with yes. With him. With him. And, 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 and the relationship we want to have is, you know, I'm not, you know, the idea is that it, it, Retrofin, which is the company, uh, the Martin Shkreli's company, you know, we're not just trying to be their CRO, right? We, 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 and that's that's the understanding is that we, we're going to do the discovery, the preclinical discovery that that might involve them as partners, but we're not necessarily wedded just, just to them. I mean, what I'm doing here is not such a radical departure from the path, but I realize that you know, talking about it, you can kind of go blue in the face. People will respond to actions. And so I've kind of, and I also have a lot more time before to maybe philosophize and, and you know, be more right. public. And yeah. you know, once now some, there's some work to do. I have work to do. You have a list of things to do today. Yeah, so there, so I actually have less time to kind of you know philosophize like that, and, yeah. and so and I also realize that in the end people respond to real templates, and so that's what we're trying to do is build a culture that people can actually see. So I encourage so all of my team. So you do see a model, a template here. Oh, absolutely. I just and, and you think it's duplicatable? Yes, I do. Uh, I, by because when we interviewed you before, you know, I said, "What's your message to science?" And you said, "My message is consider yeah. going independent." So you think this is a viable model for other people who didn't get jobs? I do. I, I, I don't know. So, yeah, I mean, I'm privileged to have the kind of pedigree I have and kind of personal circumstances I have where, you know, I, not, I don't have kids yet, right? And so I've got some flexibility there. Mm -hmm. And so I know there are aspects of what I've done that... You didn't need the same security that maybe someone a little long in the family yeah. needed or something. Yeah, and for example, I'm not... And I had a postdoc where I got paid more than, than the typical postdoc, so I was able to have some savings as well. I know a lot of people who are trainees... That was a key for you, moving out here and Absolutely, started. having a cushion and, and then, you know, not, not being able to... Not, not having to go off, live on credit card debt from the very beginning. I think a lot of people who are, who are academic trainees they never have that opportunity to accumulate any savings. And so for them, it's much more daunting, I think, to make this transition. So I would say at this stage, it's, it's not completely generalizable, but I think that, so, so maybe you won't find solo founders, you know, doing exactly what I've done just yet. I mean, there are probably some out there, but I think what's more generalizable, I think, is, is 
postdocs and trainees getting together as a group. And what I'd like to do eventually is set a model for what we're doing almost as a kind of a franchise and say, well, there's Pearlstein Lab, but there could be fill-in-the-blank lab, right? Mm -hmm. And especially, I would like to encourage more people to be taking this indie approach in the orphan disease space because it is such an unmet need and because I think that indie approach where you're more open, more seeking engagement, actually aligns with what the patient advocates are already doing. So mm -hmm. it, it, you, you know, there's, a, there's a kind of potential for synergy there that you may not find if you're doing sort of a typical biotech, if you're working in some other area of science. So I actually think that the indie model, be, it, be that what it is, is really well suited to the orphan space. Um, and so that's kind of what I'm promoting is for people to, to take the template we have and to replicate that. Gotcha. But I think in the grand, grand scheme of things, you know, you can talk about the real, I think the real culmination of indie science will be if you can have a company that allows you to amass some wealth and then you exit and then you become now that basically the wealth then is the endowment for one's own scientific pursuits. So basically getting... Oh, just the first step. Yeah, and so head in a big head out in a bigger way. Yeah, and then you know, in that case, sort of, you know, you, you can imagine kind of someone like an Elon Musk being a model there, where even though his companies are, even though after PayPal, right, he, his companies are or his ventures, his activities are all wrapped around companies. He, you could have imagined that he he takes this his fortune from PayPal, and then he goes and endows an institute. Like I tend, and I jokingly have called it the, the Institute for Rogue Scientists. So one day, if I have the complete independent, you know, financial independent means, uh, and sort of all the orphan diseases, you know, have, have treatments or something, or at least there's headway, then I can imagine in a decade or something, being able to say, okay, now I want to create a kind of a, really create like a Bell Labs, but, but be completely off of that grid in the sense that it's funded by the proceeds of the earlier commercial successes. In that sense, I think you can become an indie scientist as well. Although that smacks more like of the gentleman scientist model of the before we had independent the wealth. Yeah, and I, and I, and I, that, all, that makes me bristle a bit when people are just like, they confuse indie science for wanting to bring back, you know, basically just white, white, rich white guys doing science and no one else doing science the way it was done in the past. Even though I remind people that all the amazing discoveries that those white people did, like calculus and thermodynamics, like you can hate on them for being products of their time, but you, you know, you can't hate on their science. Although, you know, that said, I don't want to go back to that model where it's strictly the leisure class that engages in science. Uh, but, but one way I think to really do indie science is obviously to be completely financially independent and then just do whatever the hell you want. Uh, but I'm not there yet. So in the meantime, I do indie science within the confines and constraints of the current environment, but still trying to push, push the boundaries. Mm -hmm.